I'm Maud Garrett and welcome to an all new episode of RT Essentials. When we think of horror and sci-fi, it's usually in the context of movies like Alien, The Thing or Dune. Dune, if you're Australian. Less discussed is how these genres have been adapted to the small screen. While previous generations may have had a Twilight Zone or Twin Peaks once every decade to look forward to, the golden age of television has provided us a smorgasbord of out there content that keeps us up at night wondering if there's something under our beds or beyond the stars. Today, our picks don't come from our typical editorial pieces, of which you can find on our website, RottenTomatoes.com. Today's list is based on a section of our brand new book, Rotten Tomatoes, The Ultimate Binge Guide, with 296 must-see shows that changed the way we watch TV. Not only is it a fascinating look into the evolution of TV through engaging series, write-ups, infographics, and deep dive essays, we see it as a challenge, a bingeable, bucket list of the shows that you just have to see before you die, broken down into fun sections like procedurals that brought a little something extra to work, game-changing sitcoms and much more. The Ultimate Binge Guide is available for pre-order now and will be released this coming November. So make sure to grab one because there really isn't any better couch companion if you don't have one already. Trust me, these shows are better binged with others than binged alone. Anyways, this is our Rotten Tomatoes Guide to Next Level Horror and Science Fiction. Doctor Who. Living calcium. Creatures made out of living calcium. What else? What else? Hyphenated surname. Yes! That narrows it down to one planet. Raxicorical Phalopatorius! Let's start at the very beginning, or at least as far back as 1963, when the BBC premiered a new children's series featuring an alien who looked like a silly man in a long scarf known as the Doctor. Why won't you help us? I'm not hindering you. If you both want to make fools of yourselves, I suggest you do what you said you'd do. Doctor Who hopped around in a time-travelling spaceship called a TARDIS, which looked a lot like a British police box, with his young, usually female companions taking them on fantastical journeys through the outer reaches of the galaxy, which usually resembled a soundstage in London filled with paper mache rocks. Am I ginger? No, you just sort of brown. I wanted to be ginger, I've never been ginger. Created by BBC's head of drama, Sidney Newman, the original series ran on the network until 1989, holding the Guinness World Record for the longest running science fiction program of all time. I am he and he is me. And we are all together, Goo Goo Kichu. Mm -hmm. What? It's a song by the Beatles. Oh, uh, how does it go? Oh, please be quiet. And as determined by ratings and home media sales, the number one most successful science fiction show. Sorry to all you Wayward Pines and Lodge 49 heads out there hoping for a Dark Horse win. In the land of sci-fi, the Doctor is in. You can do it, I know you can. How? Because it's impossible, and you're my impossible girl. How many times have you saved me, Club? Just this once. Just for the hell of it. Let me save you! Over the years, the series has morphed from a family-friendly show starring a silly man with wild hair and a scarf into something way darker and edgier. Thirteen actors have officially played the Doctor, which regenerate, starting with William Hartnell up to Jodie Whittaker, the current and so far only official female version. Say hello to a Dalek. Signal activation in nine rails. The fleet shall be summoned. No, it won't. No matter how many times you try, no matter how long you wait, I will always be in your way, backed up by the best of humanity. Unofficially, though, there's the 1999 parody of Doctor Who, A Curse of Fatal Death. Mr. and Mrs. Doctor. <laughs> Written for comic relief, the four-part series saw several British comedians step into the role, including Rowan Atkinson. Although, in fact, he's already eaten, because I had dinner with him and suggested he place the trapdoor right here. Jim Broadbent. Ah! <laughs> You're my fiancé, aren't you? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Seem to be a bit shy of girls now. Richard E. Grant. Result, cute, sexy, and lick the mirror handsome. And absolutely fabulous, Joanna Lumley. Emma, look. I've got etheric beam locators. How's that for wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff? <laughs> the X Files. 
If you were around in the 90s, the phrase, the truth is out there, evokes some heavy duty nostalgia for Chris Carter's spooky alien procedural, The X-Files. In 1993, the show starring David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson aired on Fox, and America fell hard for Fox Mulder and Dana Scully. There's got to be an explanation. 27.34 million concurrent viewers tuned in for an episode that aired directly after 1997's Super Bowl. Some kind of spider's nest or insect cocoon. What kind of an insect could have gotten a man all the way up into that tree? What can explain the X-Files popularity? In FBI agent Fox Mulder, the nation found an obsession with the proto-cool nerd, but it was his partner that had the real-world impact. In 2018, a study from the Gina Davis Center for Media provided hard data for the Scully effect. After the show aired, more women started training for careers in scientific fields, often citing Anderson's character, the only female STEM character in a prominent primetime television role at the time, as their inspiration. You gotta cut it off! Cut it off! No! Oh! No, it's gonna come to my brain! Cut it out of me now! It was no Doctor Who, but the first run of The X-Files lasted an impressive nine seasons, ending in 2002 and breaking the Guinness World Record for longest-running sci-fi show aired in America. It also translated to two films, two revivals of the show, and a very short-lived spin-off, The Lone Gunman. He came to realize that this son had been conducting secret experiments, of which I was the most unfortunate product. The X-Files is responsible for one of television's crowning achievements of the 21st century, thanks to the 1998 episode, Drive. What the hell are you doing? I'm composing a sonnet. What does it look like I'm doing? I'm slowing down for a light. Go! Go! It starred a young Brian Cranston as a racist with a literal ticking time bomb in his head and was written by Vince Gilligan, creator of Breaking Bad, who remembered the actor when it came time to cast Walter White. You're welcome, history books. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Need a hand? No, thanks. I'm good. If the X-Files made us swoon over Mulder and Scully, Sarah Michelle Gellar inspired a generation of girls to kick butt and stake hearts as Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I'm Buffy, the Vampire Slayer, and you are? <laughs> is not having fun here? Follow me. Based on the 1992 film of the same name, Buffy premiered in 1997 on the WB and ended in 2003 on UPN. Buffy Summers was just your average teenage girl living on the top of a hellmouth, imbued with winter soldier level superpowers and cast to slay vampires. But also demons, werewolves and the occasional evil god. Look, she was not picky. How about, oh god, my leg, my leg? See? In 2010, Entertainment Weekly named Buffy the third best character of all time, coming in behind only Homer Simpson and Harry Potter. Though let's be honest, Buffy would kick both of their butts. Wingardium Levy, no, sir. <laughs> Despite the love, Buffy was mostly snubbed when it came time for awards season, only winning two Emmys total, and those were for outstanding makeup and score. <laughs> You're all gonna die. The lack of nominations was its own mini scandal, only earning 14 nominations across all categories during its entire run, the most notable of which was the best writing nod given to 1999 episode Hush, in which the characters spend most of the episode totally mute. Ouch. Thankfully though, Gella had her hardware before she even joined the cast, winning a daytime Emmy at 18 for her role in All My Children. A year later, she was cast in Buffy and found herself the star of a relentless work schedule. She was the only cast member to appear in all 145 episodes of the show, all while trying to break in big movies like I Know What You Did Last Summer and Cruel Intentions. Gella had to miss the rap party for Buffy due to a scheduling conflict with the live action adaptation of Scooby-Doo. When I find it, I'm going to make him pay for taking that kid's life. I'll make him die in ways he can't even imagine. That probably would have sounded more commanding if I wasn't wearing my yummy sushi pajamas. Supernatural. That was scary. 
one of, if not the most popular shows of all time, sci-fi, horror or otherwise, Supernatural debuted in 2005 on the WB. No prophet could have predicted how successful the story of two demon-fighting brothers travelling across the country in a Chevy Impala could be. That was a lucky break. Is that a rabbit's foot? I think it is. Creator Eric Kripke originally imagined the show as a five-season arc. The WB responding to fan interest kept the story going for another decade. Yeah, it's now the longest-running sci-fi show aired in America. Sorry, X-Files. Even though they never broke more than 1.2 million viewers for a single episode, what the members of the SPN family, the preferred moniker of Supernatural fans, lacked in numbers, they made up with intense loyalty. Although for fans, they sure do complain a lot. Listen to this. Simpatico says the demon storyline is trite, cliched, and overall craptastic. Yeah, well, screw you, Simpatico. We lived it. Annually, Supernatural fans held not one, not even two, but five conventions, which the show took and incorporated it into an ongoing storyline where Sam and Dean attend the Winchester Con, an in-world meetup for characters who follow the exploits of Sam and Dean. Why can't Sam and Dean be telling that Ruby is evil? I mean, she is clearly manipulating Sam in some kind of moral lapse. It's obvious, no? Hey! If you don't like the books, don't read them, Fritz! Okay, okay, just, uh, okay, it's okay. It helps that the Supernatural writers were fan fiction writers themselves, aka the best people to be writing your favourite program. Homages took the form of episode titles, constant pop culture references, and entire themed episodes. The Monsters of the Week episode alluded to everything from Buffy to The X-Files to It's a Wonderful Life, not to mention the whole black and white Universal Monster run-in, an episode shot from the perspective of a ghost hunting reality TV show crew, and an animated crossover with Scooby-Doo. Hi. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm Dean. It's my brother Sam. Mind if we join you? And if you thought Supernatural's meta commentary stopped there, you'd be more wrong than the critics who predicted its demise after season one. In the most famous incident, Supernatural turned the spotlight on itself as the ultimate meta fan when a spell cast Sam and Dean into the real world, where they discover the actors who play them, Jared Padalecki and Jensen Ackers, starring on a show called Supernatural, complete with IRL showrunner Sarah Gamble bossing everyone around, and Jared's wife, Genevieve Padalecki, showing up to set to the horror of the Winchesters since the couple met while she was playing the show's antagonist, Ruby. Ruby, right. That one never gets old. How was work today, hon? If it all sounds like a lot, it's only because, well, it was. Supernatural proved that when it comes to world creation, if you built it, the fans will come. Fringe. Mark Young killed himself yesterday. He sees me. No, Olivia, he definitely does not see you. <laughs> like The X-Files for the multiverse, Fringe walked so that shows like Loki could run. Like its alien-obsessed predecessor, Fringe ran on Fox, focused on FBI agents studying the paranormal and had a fervent culture fan base of die-hard stands. But where Fox Mulder was dead set on finding aliens, Joshua Jackson's Peter Bishop and his father, played by John Noble, investigated occurrences caused by parallel universes. I can't feel my arms. I can't feel my legs. Oh my god, oh my god, I feel like... Where is Walter? What did you do to me? J.J. Abrams' supernatural procedural lasted five seasons, beginning in 2008 and ending in 2013, and in that time managed to earn comparisons to, well, duh, The X-Files, but also The Twilight Zone. The creator called it a new kind of storytelling, combining the law and order procedural with something extremely serialised and very culty, like his own show, Lost. Hey, look, it never hurts to cite yourself as reference material. By the third season, the show was moved to the notorious death slot of Friday night at 9pm. The term was coined after the original Star Trek unsuccessfully petitioned NBC to get moved from 8.30 on Monday nights and ended up being forced to take Fridays at 10pm, leading Gene Roddenberry to lament, if the network wants to kill us, it couldn't make a better move. 
Coincidentally, Fringe's antagonist, William Bell, was played by Leonard Nimoy, aka Spock, on the original Star Trek. Even if you deny it now, you have always been playing God. I am. Fringe's mythology ran deep, involving a group of white bald men called the Observers, and an alternate reality where 9-11 didn't happen. We chose this time in history for a reason. A 99.9999% probability that we will succeed. As you could expect for a show coded in mysteries, there were hidden Easter eggs for the Uber fans. For example, each episode would flash a cipher before commercials. Eventually, an editor at ARS Arcana figured out this substitution cipher, which spelled out an eight-letter word per episode, which would tie into that week's theme. Considering ARG stands for Alternate Reality Game, we'd say this tracks. The Walking Dead. <laughs> The Walking Dead was the goose that laid AMC's golden egg when Robert Kirkman's comic was adapted by Frank Darabont for the cable network in 2010. <laughs> the show has had four showrunners through its entire 11 season run, a turnover that you'd expect in the cast of a zombie show, but not its creators. <laughs> Come, come with us. Come on. We have to go. No. When it was announced that season 11 would be the last one, it became per episode the longest running cable drama on television of all time, with a total of 177. Also, here's a fun fact. Norman Reedus' character, Daryl Dixon, was not part of the comic series. The Boondock Saints actor auditioned for Merle and was rejected. But the writers loved him so much, they wrote the new part for him. He's now the lead of the series. Sorry, brother. Rick Grimes is not gone from the world of The Walking Dead. Actor Andrew Lincoln confirmed that he'll be starring in a trilogy of spin-off movies set in the world of The Walking Dead. That's in addition to the two spin-off series currently in existence, The Walking Dead, The World Beyond, and Fear of the Walking Dead. I found him. Robert Kirkman explained why the creatures are referred to as walkers. Zombie fiction doesn't exist in the Walking Dead universe. There's no Night of the Living Dead, no Shaun of the Dead, no The Walking Dead. That's why the characters don't know basic zombie survival skills 101. They didn't grow up with World War Z as required reading. American Horror Story. What art thou doing? I know that I'm about to die. <laughs> and I want the world to know exactly who is responsible for my... Full of real sailor was. Och, in the dark, I just... Cool me. Yeah, best. American Horror Story premiered in 2011 as a seasonal anthology series, which series creators Ryan Murphy and Brad Fulchik explained before the first episode even aired would mean that each season would have a different plot and a different cast. With the exception of AHS 1984, each season starred the same cast, adding new members to the gang each season. Also, season 4's Freak Show established that it existed in the same continuum as season 2, which eventually revealed that all the separate stories told were actually connected by a shared universe. It's okay if that doesn't make sense. I have no intention of finding out who that is. This place gives me the creeps. Measured by seasons, American Horror Story beat The Walking Dead for the longest running cable drama. Though due to its structure as a limited edition series, it only has about half the episodes of any given season of the AMC show. The show was not messing around when it came to heavy hitters. Jessica Lange has won two Emmys, a Golden Globe and a Screen Actors Guild Award during her American Horror Story tenure. I mean, you would never intentionally expose these little angels to a homosexual, would you? And we both know what that so-called 
monster in the closet really is, don't we, Miss Winters? While James Cromwell and Kathy Bates both won Emmys for their performances in the show. And oh yeah, Sarah Paulson, who has ascended to the A-list thanks to the Murphyverse. <laughs> Surprised when Lady Gaga won her own Emmy for season 5's Hotel. Casting the art pop singer to play the vampiric owner of Hotel Chavez made perfect sense. But this was before A Star Is Born, and it was the singer herself who called and begged Murphy for the role. Will Drake can't die until after I marry him and take every goddamn penny. Being a limited series allowed the show to grab up nominations during award seasons, as it didn't have to compete with traditional TV shows, only TV movies. After that, cable premium and streaming providers took notice and began a trend of prestige anthology television. Bates Motel. Norman! Shut the dumb Shut up! Base Motel was, as the name implies, a prequel to Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. The ANC series from Carlton Cuse ran from 2013 to 17 and starred Vera Farmiga and Freddie Highmore as a young Norman Bates and his mother, Norma. Timothy Chalamet botched his audition for the show when he accidentally rented American Psycho instead of Psycho and based his performance on Patrick Bateman instead of Norman Bates. So, you know what, let's just go ahead and green light that show already, because that would be great. But he can take solace knowing that the casting was kind of rigged from the start. What does this have to do with anything? Because I stayed in this world for you, mother! After seeing the young actor in Finding Neverland, Vera Farmiga told Bates Motel creators that she'd only agree to be in the show if they cast Freddie Highmore as her son. Don't lie to me! So what could they say? Mother always knows best. It wouldn't be because you're trying to put me together with her for some reason. You know, because you think Bradley's too much for me or something. Of course not. I just think that Emma is a nice, smart girl. So That's you're just going to pick out my girlfriend? It's not like Bradley's your girlfriend. Why not? You don't go out or anything. It's because her dad died, okay? It's not exactly the right time. <laughs> Born the same year Anthony Perkins died, the 21-year-old actor was cast to play the teenage killer in 2013. During the events of Psycho, Norman is only 22. The star proved to be worth the investment, since the prodigious Highmore turned out to be a triple threat. By the end of its run, he'd written two episodes of the show and even directed one during the final season. I'm sure he made his mother very proud. Something dark in you, mother. I know you killed that woman. And you, you are trying to pin it all on me and have me locked up. Well, I am not going to let you do that. And let's talk about the house that Bates built. Norman and Norma's home in the series may look like it's been around since American Gothic was a thing, but in fact, it was a new structure built for the show to resemble the one from Psycho. The day after the show wrapped, the house was dismantled, probably because no one wanted to rent it as an Airbnb when there was a cheap motel right next door. What sort of a person runs away from their sick child? Do you have any idea what pain she suffered? Feeling abandoned by her own mother. Stranger Things. Netflix's hit series, Stranger Things, follows a group of 80s kids growing up in the fictional town of Hawkins, Indiana. When one of their friends goes missing and a girl named Eleven shows up with a shaved head and supernatural powers, the gang discovers there's more to their sleepy town than meets the eye. Specifically, the Upside Down, another dimension populated by demons called demigorgons and Lovecraftian beings like the Mind Flayer. Throw in a shady government black site called Hawkins Lab and you have the setup for what Buffy might have called a hellmouth. Clocking in at roughly eight episodes per season, the second one had nine, Stranger Things made Cable's limited series look like war and peace. But that didn't stop the Emmys from considering it a traditional drama. Specifically, the three season show has garnered 39 Emmy nominations and four wins. What's wrong with Winston? What's wrong with Winston? He joined the team super late. He's not funny, and he's not even a scientist. Yeah, but he's so cool. If he's cool, then you be Winston. What? I can't. Why not? 
Because, be, 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 because you're not black? I didn't say that. You thought it. But it's the kids who made the show, because Stranger Things understood our generation's comfort blankets, the late 80s nostalgia and binge-watching television. For millennials, the Regan years are now exclusively seen through rose-tinted wayfarers. And there's not a single frame in Stranger Things that doesn't capitalise on the era. From the Eggos eaten by Eleven, to the gang's Ghostbusters costumes in season two, Back to the Future, Star Wars, even the casting is a nod to the 80s, bringing Winona Ryder and Sean Astin, a Heather and a Goonie together for the ultimate 80s shipdom that we never knew we needed. But by far the biggest breakout star of the show was Millie Bobby Brown, who was only 13 when she netted her first Emmy nod for the show, becoming the youngest person to ever be on Time's 100 list. But before any of that, she was just a girl sending in a self-tape audition. Having just been rejected for a part on Game of Thrones, she was hired without anyone in the cast or crew having met her in person. And look at her now. She's friends with Godzilla and King Kong. <laughs> The Haunting of Hill House. Nelly? On October 12th, 2018, Netflix dropped all 10 episodes of Mike Flanagan's ghostly series based on Shirley Jackson's 1959 classic horror novel, The Haunting of Hill House. It was a very loose adaptation of the source material and pretty tragic. In a world full of slick Blumhouse horror, Hill House was a slow meditation on the spectre of grief and its effects on the Crane family, whose matriarch died in mysterious circumstances while the family renovated the old home. Hill House episodes were split up, each focusing on the perspective of one family member, and within that, divided into the past and present. But the true MVP of Hill House was the 17-minute, seemingly continuous tracking shot in an episode called Two Storms, which somehow moved through space and time without cutting away. Get away from the window! Jesus Christ! It was actually accomplished with five long takes that were edited together, which is still incredibly hard to pull off. They were only able to run the whole thing through three times. Luckily, it worked out. The Haunting of Hill House encouraged multiple viewings after Eagle Eye fans spotted ghostly apparitions in the background of every episode, hidden in plain sight. Vulture reported 30 sightings over the course of Hill House with at least one ghost of note. Actor Bruce Greenwood, who'd appeared alongside Hill House star Carla Gugino in the director's adaptation of Stephen King's Gerald's Game for the streaming service. 2020 saw Flanagan's follow-up to Hill House, The Haunting of Bly Manor. While it featured many of the same cast members and shared a similar sound name, the two stories were not connected by anything other than a love of good classic literature. It's time to wake up, sweetheart. <laughs> so that's our list of essential horror and sci-fi TV shows. Hope you aren't too spooked out by that one. Be sure to head on over to RottenTomatoes.com for our essential viewing lists and, of course, to check out Rotten Tomatoes' The Ultimate Binge Guide book, a bingeable bucket list of all the shows that you need to see before you die. Coming November with pre-orders open now. For Rotten Tomatoes, I'm Maud Garrett, signing off for now. Keep the lights on at night if you need to. And remember, the truth was within you the whole time.